Well, Megan, I've been wearing Vionic shoes for over three years now, but this month, my trusted shoe brand and I entered a new phase of our relationship, international travel. Well, Sarah, that is a serious commitment, (laughs) right? You can't just pack any shoe for a trip abroad. It's got to be stylish enough for those major cosmopolitan cities. It's got to be sturdy enough for trains, planes, buses, and city streets. And obviously, it's got to be comfortable enough to support your feet over many, many miles of walking. Well, no surprise, my Vionics were up to the task. I had two pair with me, a pair of casual sneakers in a cool gray color, and then a weatherproof suede ankle boot that I swear still looks brand new after 10 days on soggy sidewalks. Megan, the only time my feet hurt the entire trip was New Year's Eve when I made the mistake of wearing a pair of booties not from Vionic. So I'll just leave that data right here for you. Okay, well, that's pretty conclusive, Sarah. Vionic has the best curated styles to get you ready for whatever 2024 has in store, whether it's jet setting like Sarah or keeping up with busy mom life on this side of the pond. They even offer a 30 day guarantee, wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code the mom hour 15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one time use only. Bionic Shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Mom Hour. I am Megan Francis, here as always with Sarah Powers. What's up, Sarah? Hey, Megan. It feels like we've, it's been a while. I know. We've done this. I was with you in person last week, so we didn't record. But it's like it, it always takes us a little time to get back in the routine. It so, does. And it's a very yeah. different energy being together in person versus the way we record. We should actually really quickly tell the story about when we, we had to record a couple uh, segments quickly when we were together yes. in a hotel. <laughs> it took way longer than it needed to. Do you remember what happened? The noise from above? <gasps> oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. So there was like, they were doing something. What were they doing? Construction. Like they were working on the floors. But the funny thing is we had all morning to do it and we kind of kept putting it off. And then we got buckled down, like sat down, set everything up. And, and they like, literally started <laughs> tapping on the, the banging. Yes. The banging begins. Well, if you like random stories about Sarah and I, you're going to love this because this is one of our more than mom episodes where we kind of don't do what we generally do on Tuesdays, which is tackle, you know, tackle a parenting topic and um, give actual advice. We're just talking about fluffy stuff. And today I thought it would be fun for us to just kind of share some random things. I really wanted to do. I love when we talk about when we were younger and I love like kind of shaping a show around that. So this one's pretty heavily focused on um, I called it Megan and Sarah go back in time, although some of it's not. You know, it's not all about that time, but because we could also speak for hours yes. um, if we were just let go, I kind of organized it into talking about work and style. So oh, work like during it. the first half and then style during the second half. I like it. I like the questions you picked. This is always fun for me because I just, I just show up. You just show up and, and get to answer some maybe embarrassing things about yourself. I don't know. It looks like you have a couple things in here that are going to be a little embarrassing to talk about. I mean, the longer we do this show, the more layers that have to get peeled back. <laughs> you're right. You're right. <laughs> yeah, we uh, eventually will run out of stories. Maybe not. Sarah, you know, when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. Maybe it's my rebel tendencies, but having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product the algorithm sends my way. You know what's not too good to be true, though? Our sponsor, Ritual, and their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean, bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh, minty essence in every bottle, so you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. 
We are welcoming a new sponsor today, Dr. Mom Butt Balm. Sarah, this might sound a little weird, but when my kids were babies, I actually really enjoyed changing diapers. It felt like a little time out to connect. Oh yeah, Megan, I can totally remember that feeling of just kind of leaning in and enjoying a little moment in your routine. Yeah, but when my babies had diaper rash, it made the whole experience so much less fun for both of us. And back in those days, we didn't have great options for rash cream either. It was usually goopy, heavy, and full of dyes and preservatives and other things I didn't really want to put on my baby's butt. Well, the creator of Dr. Mom Butt Balm, who is a mom and also a doctor, had the same experience, Megan, and she did something about it. Dr. Mom Butt Balm is free of dyes, preservatives, and zinc oxide. It's easy to apply, easy to remove, and you don't have to use a lot to protect your baby's skin. I really love the way this balm feels. It's almost like a high-end skin cream. Very nice, no strong scent, and definitely nothing like the diaper rash creams I used to struggle with. Don't let diaper rash come between you and your baby. Shop for Dr. Mom Butt Balm online at Amazon or Walmart today. Okay, so I guess I'll ask the questions. I'll let you go first, and then, or maybe sometimes I'll jump in first. But for this first one, I'm going to let you go first. So, Sarah, what did you do for a living before you became a mom? Very good question. And I feel like these, some of these are things I feel like we've talked about and teased, but we've never like really dived in on them. So people might not know. Yeah, definitely. And we always have people listening at various degrees of obsession. So not everybody (laughs) has listened to everything. Well, really briefly, in case you don't know, after college, I danced professionally in ballet companies and modern dance companies and jazz, one jazz company who thought I was okay enough. I'm really bad at jazz, but, um, and I also waited tables and taught dance during that time. So I skipped over that part to like when I was a more traditional professional. So right before I had kids, I was a corporate writer and strategic relationships manager for a mid-sized company. I worked directly for the CEO and I did everything from, um, ghostwriting articles and creating newsletter content internally for the company. I also did, I also developed Um, like internal educational content for seminars and meetings that was internal to the company or internal to our industry partners. So I didn't work on communications that were client facing, but I worked on basically everything else. Um, So it was good. I I had a lot of PowerPoint knowledge at that time. I did a lot of writing, like regular writing, like articles. And, um, but I also like did a little bit of event management and a, a little bit of relationship management because I worked directly for the CEO. We were always, it was a growing company. And so there was always uh, key players in the industry that we wanted to connect with or impress. And I was sometimes involved in, uh, the communication surrounding mm-hmm. that, if that makes okay. sense. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no, that makes, that makes sense. That sounds like, that sounds like a job I would have liked to have had yeah. at some point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, I had kids really young. So before I had Jacob, I was a college student, but I was also temping a lot. Um, by the time I would say that I actually got pregnant with him. I was probably taking about a nine, like a nine credit load semester, I think. Okay. And so I was taking mostly evening classes and then I was filling my days with working in various um, different temp jobs. And like the one, oh my gosh, there was always so much intrigue in a company. And when you're the temp, like no one notices you Mm -hmm. and no one pays any attention to you usually. So I remember I would go in. And often it was literally someone's on maternity leave. So we need someone to sit at this desk right. and wait for the phone to ring, right. which sometimes it doesn't. Um, this was before a lot of businesses had internet. Mm-hmm. So you would have a computer, but like nothing to do on it. Right. Like, it's not like I could surf the web or whatever. <laughs> so I would have it open. I would like make these elaborate spreadsheets for who knows what. Sometimes I'd, I'd always have like a yellow. There's always lots of yellow pads. Right. And I would like, I don't even know, like plan out my life or whatever I was going to do. I just remember spending a lot of time writing and playing around with spreadsheets because I had like literally nothing else to do. But there was also drama. Like I remember working in this um, architect's office and this would have been, you know, the late nineties and people still smoked in there. Like all the architects smoked in the office. It was crazy. And I'd be sitting there like, is this legal? I guess it was legal. I don't think, well, if it wasn't legal, nobody had like come in and shut them down for it. Right. And people weren't complaining yet. Um, I worked in another place where like, there was some drama between the partners and then one of the partners died. Oh wow! And I came in the next day and like his kids came over and told me that he died, but like not to say anything because I like, it was, oh my so gosh. Cr- <laughs> it was crazy. So that was all that was like all this intrigue. And I just kind of sat there and watched it. 
I bet like, that was like fun in a way. Like it was you, you're like such an observer yeah. of human nature. So well, it was like being Harriet the Spy, yeah. and I was like, I got to sit and watch, and I had such low stakes. Like nothing yeah. I did mattered. Like it's not like I was doing a job where you know, my performance really made a huge difference in most cases. There were, sometimes there were roles where, um, when I was pregnant with Jacob, I ended up working for a huge, um, health insurance company and like a really well-known one. And they had just like completely discontinued one of the plans they had or something Mm -hmm. or like the company got acquired. And so they had absorbed this other company. That's what it was. And I was like the first stop. Like I was the 800 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. healthcare or whatever. But if anybody called in about that other thing, I was supposed to just dump them into this voicemail that oh I knew my. no one was checking. Oh so like I would have people call back and say, um, I called yesterday about my claim and you, you know, sent me to this voicemail, but no one's called me back. And then I had no choice but to say, OK, well, let me try again. And then I would send them to the same voicemail. It was awful. Oh, my it gosh. Was, <laughs> yeah. So like ones like that were stressful, but there were plenty of that were just an easy way to sit around and collect, you know, at the time, probably right. eight bucks an hour. Right. So, oh my gosh. Yeah, there you go. All right. <laughs> so that was actually kind of fun. I enjoyed being a temp. Nice. Um, okay. So what is the worst job you ever had? Well, okay. So I worked in a lot of restaurants and I had a lot of like worst day on the jobs. I have a lot right. of like restaurant kind of nightmare bosses or like terrible things, but I, I actually liked those jobs and I really liked waiting tables. So I had to think of something else. Um, and I, the thing that came to mind was a very early babysitting gig I had where I, I mean, really, I I was probably 12 or 13 and I had to go, there's, I I think of this on so many levels now as a mom, but I had to go to my dad's office and there was a woman there who either was on maternity leave or was just transitioning back from maternity leave. So she was in meeting, she was back at the office, but she had a very small infant And probably because of breastfeeding or whatever, she wanted to have her infant there, maybe not every day, but there was some kind of an arrangement where this woman was bringing her baby to the office, a kind of a corporate environment. And I would go and like, just the baby slept a lot. So I was just like, Mm -hmm. I wasn't really babysitting. I was just kind of there to like, keep the baby happy. And the mom was kind of down the hall in a meeting and the baby cried. Like everyone assured me, like, you don't need to know how to work with babies. I was so young. I was 12 or 13. They were like, well, it doesn't matter because the mom's right down the hall. She'll come if anything, you know, if you, if you get out of your league. And I just remember the baby cried inconsolably. And I felt so embarrassed because I was not by myself. It wasn't like I was at their house where I could figure it out for myself. I, there was all like under pressure with people watching, including other moms and other parents who probably thought, Oh my gosh, this, this, kid is not equipped to deal with a crying baby. I'm sure I barely knew how to hold a baby. So that is just, it wasn't a real job, but it is one where I look back and I'm like, Oh, I was so ill-equipped. And I felt so like in a, in a, um, you know, like a fishbowl, like a a literal fishbowl, because I think I was in an office area with glass doors where people were looking in and be like, what is happening? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. No, that sounds like, that sounds like what people watching you try to like sweat through something yes. hard is the worst especially when you're 13 yeah like, well, yeah I was never a very good babysitter I, I never I, really honestly loved it. I wasn't really either because I didn't I didn't ever bond to the kids I babysat yeah, me neither. so it's not pleasant like when I baby actually when I was like 11 I started getting babysitting gigs for the kids that my mom um took care of during mm-hmm. the day it's like she had a daycare in the house and those were actually first of all I was at the perfect age because I actually loved hanging out with the kids and yeah and also I already had relationships with these kids yeah so those jobs were actually pretty good but when I got older and I was just randomly showing up at people's houses to watch their kids like I wasn't great at it I I didn't really care about their kids I, yeah and I didn't I, I wasn't <laughs> someone who was nostalgic for childhood play like I always kind of yeah. wanted to be older than I was I, so when I was 14 or 15 I wasn't missing the days of play-doh and barbies i was like wanting to be 18 and in college so i just didn't have any i wasn't good at playing with kids i mean i kept them alive but you did keep them alive and you know what that counts (laughs) barely kept this infant alive though i mean it was not (laughs) happy that i was in charge oh (laughs) okay how about you sarah um okay so when i was in and i had a lot of grunt jobs like everybody does right or most teenagers do but the one that really stands out this may have been my only no call no show where i just (laughs) never went back um that i can remember anyway It was at a steak and shake. I worked there my, I think the first semester of my second year of college, John and I were dating and we both worked at steak and shake and they loved him. 
Okay. And they were super mean to me. Oh, and I think sad. I, it was all women, like everybody who made the schedule and all the other wait, you know, wait staff were all women. And they fawned over John. They gave him all the best tables. And he was good. Like he would get huge tips. But something about like dude servers, I think people just interact with him differently. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but like he killed it. And I was really intent on doing it right. Like making sure the food got out when it was mm -hmm. when it needed to, blah, blah, blah. So I was a hustler and I would run around and make sure everything got done correctly. But I just don't, I don't think I was particularly friendly. I yeah. think I was just like wanting to get it done. Yeah. Um, my sister was a like a career waitress for... I want to say like 15 or 20 years. And she had a place where she worked where everyone knew her and would ask for mm -hmm. her by name. I was never that kind of server. Like mm -hmm. I don't like small talk. I don't particularly like niceties. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, I'm a friendly person, but in that role, it was just a little different anyway. Yeah. So it got to the point where like I was being sabotaged by the other servers. And then they even told John not to help me. Like, he oh, would, sad. and they would give me like these really awful tables and they would know, like they'd give me the table full of like, drunk guys that just got out of the bar or like, you know, a bunch of teenagers or like the church ladies who'd never tip. Like they knew they had these tables <laughs> and they would give them to me and then they would like punish me. I don't. And I, what did I ever do to them? One day I actually got super, super sick and they made me come in. And I was like, you don't want me there. I like, I think I have the flu and they made me come in and they were so mean that I left and I That's never went back. So terrible. That's like workplace harassment. It is What's the statute of limitations on this. I should go back. I should go back and start something with these people. Ugh. But no, anyway. So I'm sorry. I like their fries and their burgers, but I would never work at a steak and shake again. <laughs> well, that's so, that. That's that. It's done. <laughs> if they were hoping to get me back, it's not going to happen now. Oh. Uh, okay. So next question. Okay. Have you ever done anything weird or and or embarrassing for money? Okay. So I had to take a twist on this because I, I couldn't think of anything that specifically answers to this question, but I do have a funny story. Um, growing up in Santa Barbara, there's a very famous, well-known at the time, at least photography school, um, pri like private, I don't know, it's a graduate program or what, but it would draw photographers from all over the country and they would always need models for various photo, you know, not the traditional, not like a catwalk model, but just, right. you know, for their photography. And because I was a dancer and my dance studio was right in the same area, it wasn't uncommon to somehow have a collaboration like, oh, we're doing this photography project. We need some ballerinas or we need people who can move because they love doing that kind of stuff. Right. So a, a few different times I would do these projects and sometimes you get paid and I was a teenager and sometimes you would just get the prints, which as a dancer, an aspiring dancer, that was really cool to have a really cool artistic yeah. shot of yourself dancing and sometimes like in a crazy costume or at the beach or so anyway, it was a cool opportunity. As a mom now, I think, oh my gosh, like uh, my 15 year old daughter is going to go get photographed by someone I don't know. <laughs> right. And I think, I, I do think my mom was probably like a little cautious about it. And I remember her coming with me sometimes and there was it was never totally sketchy, but I can see how on the outside it would seem to be. But there was this one person who had me do a whole bunch of dance modeling. Like I, I was like in this crazy costume down at the beach and then we were in a studio and one was like early in the morning and it was a couple, two or three different sessions and the, it was never going to be for money, but it was going to be for these amazing prints, right? Like these amazing copies of these photographs. And I was maybe getting older, like thinking about college and thinking about all the ways I could use these cool photographs of myself dancing. And this guy dropped off the face of oh, the planet no. stopped returning calls. We never, I remember my mom being so mad because I did a lot of work and mm -hmm. it was like just one of those things where it was this handshake deal. Um, and I, it wasn't even money, but it was like kind of putting you were yourself to get something out there. Out yeah. Out and yeah. like, you know, I was borrowing costumes from the studio. I was hustling to right. like help this person with their creative project. So wherever that person Bummer. is, they've got really cool photos of me that I never of you. saw. Ooh. So that didn't even really answer your question, but I thought it was kind of a funny story. Maybe somehow they'll make their way back to you now. Like right? maybe like I'll someone see them, like, who knows stock this guy will <laughs> hear this and then put the guilt on him. Or they'll be like, I knew I recognized the girl who's in this picture. Right. And oh then send gosh. it to you. I don't but know. the Brooks, Brooks Institute is the photography, um, whatever school. And uh, there were okay. all kinds of cool, like when we were really little, um, you could get really good family photographs and cool artsy photographs of your kids and stuff because there were these students who wanted, they needed portfolio work. So it was a cool right. thing to have nearby. But anyway, how huh. about you? 
Um, okay, so, you know, we've been listening to this um, podcast, The Dream. We have. You and I both. I'm done. Oh, are you? So I, I think I'm like in episode six or seven, um, but it's about multi-level marketing companies. And it's just had me thinking about the fact that I am a four, at least four time, possibly five time, if I really thought about it, multi-level marketing failure. So I don't think I knew that this to this degree, this could probably so, be a whole episode, but it probably could be um, my first stint. I was 17 and I went with my stepmom to a Mary Kay like sales meeting, like they, like a pep rally, basically uh-huh. to try to get you all riled up. And one of the national sales directors and people treated her like she was a God, like, mm-hmm. I mean, it was kind of crazy was there and speaking and she was very inspiring. And I've always had this entrepreneurial spirit and I like makeup. Um, and I was just like, this is it. I could do this. And then I could like, I was just about to go to college. Um, and I was thinking like, this would be a great way to have some extra money, blah, blah, blah. I'll know so many people at school. I'll just be able mm-hmm. to sell to everybody, yada, yada. So this is, and Mary Kay went through a pretty big rebrand or brand refresh, I would say like, after this time okay. but this was still what it was kind of old like it was your mom's makeup yes yeah. the women wore a lot of heavy blue eyeshadow yeah. and like it just like the packaging kind of felt like a little mature and stuff but I liked the product and what I didn't think and oh because I wasn't actually old enough to sign into legally like sign mm-hmm. a binding contract right. they had to kind of like wink wink nudge nudge it like I remember <laughs> the director that I came with that brought me and my stepmom brought me over to this national sales director and had her like, she literally winked and like her eyelashes were so covered in mascara that like the <laughs> wink kind of briefly stuck. Like stuck together. <laughs> like, yeah, it was like, um, like Lucille Bluth when yeah. she winks. Yes. It was kind yes. of like that. Yes. Um, on Arrested Development. But so she, <laughs> she was like, oh, that's okay. So she signed me in. My stepmom put up the cash. Um, and then I failed because first of all, what I didn't think about when I was all like, all you know excited and like getting all in a lather I didn't think about the fact that none of my friends had any money like right. nobody had money to spend on real right. skincare products and it wasn't super expensive I do remember that the basic skincare set which you weren't supposed to break up like you weren't supposed to sell the pieces individually uh-huh. you were really supposed to sell it all at once as one I think at the time was 56 dollars I don't okay. remember why that sticks in my head but it does and all of my friends were like using three dollar clean and clear or like Noxima, yeah. like we weren't using real product yet. So, and nobody, none of my friends wore makeup. Right. Really. Like mascara, I guess. And it was maybe in like the kind, the part of the nineties where like naturally natural grunge, like. Yeah. Like yeah. It was less like overly 95, made up. Yeah. I guess. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So that went nowhere. Well, later when I had Jacob and maybe even Jake, maybe both, maybe Jacob and I was like, I signed up again. <laughs> <laughs> because some new person got me all excited. And I was like, well, now it's totally different. Like now I'm staying home with my kids and like, I know more, I know moms and I know people who actually wear makeup. It was a failure again, because what I, what I remembered the second time is I don't like selling. Like, I don't like that kind of selling. Mm-hmm. I don't like, like some of the suggestions were like, you know, talk up somebody on the bus and tell them that you like their lipstick and then give them a sample and then call them up. And I just knew I was never going to do any of that stuff. Right. So that was a fail. Um, then I sold and I'm putting sold in the biggest air quotes ever <laughs> creative memories, which is a scrapbooking. Uh huh. The reason I did that was because my stepmom was super into it. She was like a heavy duty scrapbooker. Okay. And honestly, it was just cheaper to get the stuff it cost if right. you signed up and I got a lot of stuff. Uh, I don't regret that one because I never thought, I never really thought I would sell it. Yeah. I just, I bought it cause I wanted to get a bunch of the stuff that was in the starter kit. Yeah. I made two or three scrapbooks. It was fine. But I did at the end, I had so much, like we still have, um, the starter kit came with a bunch of scissors mm-hmm. and I have, I still have the scissors all over the place. That's like awesome. you were supposed to bring them to the parties or the workshops right. or whatever. And then the last one I did was body shop at home. Mm. And that one actually, I made a little money and then I got out. So that one was, this was probably the mid to, this was probably like 2004. Huh. I'm going to say. I haven't heard of this I, one. William was a baby. I don't think it ever really took off, but I love body shop products mm-hmm. the mall that I lived near did not have body shop I remember that and that's kind of like how it got on my radar and I wanted some specific thing that they had and you could order but they also made it really easy to order online mm-hmm. so I think I had like two like internet parties where I invited friends people put their order in I ordered stuff I got a bunch of products right I probably made fifty dollars and right. then I was like and and seen and seen well it sounds I'm like done. you got more uh like finely tuned into what would 
like why you were doing it and what right. would make it um, not successful, but what would make it like worth it, to worth me. it yeah. for you, which yeah, is that's true. Yeah. I, yeah. And I wasn't by the time I, you know, by the time I did like creative memories and body shop, I was no longer starry eyed. Right. And in thinking, oh, my gosh, this is the answer to all my family's problems. Right. And I think that individual companies also sell the opportunity differently mm-hmm. and have mm-hmm. a different culture about the way they sell the opportunity. And like, I don't remember feeling pressured with those two. And right. I do remember thinking like with Mary Kay, like, this is it. Right. Right. This is it. This I'm going to do it. I'm going to be rich. <laughs> I'm going to have a pink Cadillac. <laughs> I never got, I never got close to I see one around Cadillac. my town once in a while. There's a couple here. Yeah. 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 So, and, and at that time, the, the entry level car was like a Grand Am. And I remember thinking like, Ooh, I could zip around town in my Grand Am. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get close to that either. <laughs> I lost money on that deal. We will oh, link boy. up that podcast if anyone's interested. It's like yes. a whole rabbit hole you can go down. It re- is definitely a rabbit hole. Oh, all right. So, um, okay. What did you, next question. What mm-hmm. did you think you wanted to do for a living when you were like in high school? And it, does it in any way resemble what you do now? Yeah. Well, the answer to this question is, what did I write on those mash fortune telling games that you would right. play with your friends of like your future career? And there was always three or four ones that you wanted to be. And then you always had to include one that you didn't right? like right. garbage collector or something. Right. So mine were always dancer, teacher, writer, mom. I guess I meant like stay at home mom. I'm not sure yeah. what my conception was of that. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, you can be a writer. I mean, you can be a mom and all those other things, but right. I pretty much have done all of those things. The only thing I haven't done in a formal capacity is the teacher part in the traditional sense. But I taught dance and I t- quote unquote teach through this podcast, through my yeah. work in the school library. Like I do, I come from a long line of teachers. So I do feel like there's this like teacher in me that's never been in a classroom and probably it's good that way. Like I, mm-hmm. um, but I, I feel like, yeah, I, they've all related to what I've done in some way. How about you? So similar, like I wanted to be an actress or performer. And mm-hmm. I actually wanted to be a teacher pretty badly in middle, uh, elementary and middle school and had gotten over that by the time I was in mm-hmm. high school. I considered being like, um, like an English professor. Yeah. I think, I, I, think yeah. I thought of that at some point too. By the time I was actually in college, I did not yeah. want to be. I know that English I toyed professor. with the idea of becoming some kind of college instructor, even if it was just you know, part-time at a community college. But I think I just, it just, my path never took me there. And I was kind of over it Yeah, <laughs> by that point. But writer, um, actress slash performer. And interesting about mom, because um, I remember always knowing I wanted to have kids, like always, like never having any doubt about that. But I never thought, like it never occurred to me to think how being a mom would fit with the rest of it. Right. Well, I never even thought about it. Yeah. And it's kind of silly that I wrote it as a career option, as if it's like in a box that's mutually exclusive to those other things. But that just represents like my pretty immature understanding of how things work. And I mean, I was in a community with a mix of working and stay at home moms, but I definitely, I think I saw stay at home mom as you know, a, like a, job. A, a job and a path that, that right. people intentionally chose, I guess. Like yeah. some did and some didn't choose that, but it was an option. So I guess that's why it was on there. Yeah. Um, so, and I guess, I mean, I haven't really gotten paid to act except I did make 50 bucks once to do an improv murder mystery thing. That was pretty terrible. Yeah. Um, but you've made it a major part of, but your it's a major part of my life. life. Yeah. I have been paid to direct like, so yes, that yeah. is definitely part of my life and writing is a part of my life. And I guess you could call this some kind of performance in a weird way yeah so, yeah definitely yeah. yeah so it's kind of funny we we did all the things we thought we were gonna do Sarah well, I guess we should, we set the bar kind of low maybe <laughs> like we didn't put astronaut and like congresswoman yeah. no. president see that's why I didn't do any of those things very no, I'd be disappointed very modest ambitions exactly. between the two of us <laughs> we did it we right. did it anyway Sarah when my kids were little I was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin. I knew that modern kids' diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps, but I also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. They're filled with sugar, they have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them, and I was like, why would I give these to my kids? Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution, Haya, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. 
Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash MomHour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. All right, let's get back to it. We're going to talk about fashion now. Yes. Now that we set everybody up. Okay, Sarah, question for you. Did you have a particular style of dress that you aspired to in your teens or early 20s? Yes, I feel like there were several. I was very big into fashion aspiration. I still am. I have a, there's like a difference between the clothes that I wear and the clothes that I look at and kind of fantasize about. So I don't know, maybe when I'm like 65, I will just wear crazy outlandish clothes. But I feel like, (laughs) yeah, I always have. I had this journal where I would cut out outfits that I loved. And it was usually at this time, like perfectly vintage Levi 501 jeans or cutoffs from like kind of the grunge thrift store era, but somehow that also fit really cute and didn't look sloppy. So that was one thing I remember just, you know, idolizing, never could find in my local thrift store. Um, And then with like tank top and a flannel or something, that was just kind of the look. But I also remember I was very heavily influenced by dancer culture because I was a dancer. So I remember like thinking about the outfits I would wear to the studio and looking at, you know, magazine pictures of ballerinas. So that was like a whole subset of my, you know, my aspirational style that was like in the ballet world. And it was like usually this look of like a million leg warmers and layers and like warm up pants and like a sweatshirt with the neck cut out and yet somehow still looking like you weighed 105 pounds, even with all of those all things those on, layers on yeah. you know, like kind of messy hair, but you know, it's like a perfect bun. So I spent a lot of time thinking about that kind of stuff. And then I also have always loved vintage. And for a while I like really liked kind of like post-World War II. We're going to talk about this later, but like 1940s vintage yeah. style too, like swinger style a little bit. But Yeah. Well, I, so I also love like dancer style. Like that's definitely something I, I would look at and think, gosh, I wish I could pull that off. I will say now that I've been doing all this crazy amount of yoga lately, I was gonna I'm say, basically you are. living it. Like yeah, you look, you, it is like a ballerina look. Yeah. I have like always, I'm pretty much in leggings all the time. I, I brought jeans to California and never put them on. Yeah. Um, so I've been living in leggings and like oversized sweaters yeah. and yeah, and like hair up and stuff. So, and I, I do like that look. I think it works for me. Um, I try also tried the vintage thing for a while and I just felt like an, I felt like an imposter. Like yeah. I love it, but I think you have to have a really specific, like overall look to yep. pull that off and like be bold about it and really own it. And I just. I've always felt like a kid playing dress up yeah, whenever I've tried to do that. And you have to be a little bit consistent. I think it's one of yes. those things where you have to decide this is my style. Whereas yeah. I always kind of felt like it was like a fun dress up thing. And then the next day I just wanted to wear jeans and a t-shirt. Like, yeah, something. you have to have the lipstick yeah. and the hair and yeah. the dress and the yeah. right hose and the shoes and all that stuff. Um, so when I was a teen or a tween though, I, so I really wanted to be that girl, like in the Delia's catalog, which mm-hmm. at that time it was sort of hippie. Mm-hmm. It was starting like, this was like the, you know, mid nineties and it was starting to have that very hippie feeling. But I went to this small high school in a small town, um, kind of like in the middle of the country and very conservative and nobody dressed that way. And right. I just didn't have the guts or the budget or the fashion sense to really pull it off. Um, I lived in like, you know, jeans that were like post eighties, but not, not really embracing like the late nineties. Um, like we weren't tight rolling them anymore, right? but they also weren't like the bootlegs right. yet. So yes. it was kind of that, like kind of ugly in between. Yeah. And I've like had tucked in rugby shirts that were always oversized. Like anything that at that time that looked like it came out of your dad's closet yeah. at my school was in and half of my clothes actually did come out of my dad's closet. <laughs> I remember in particular a sweater of his that I was always borrowing until I think I just kept it. Um, and then I got into college and then I feel like we started taking like some more risks. Like Jenna and I would, you know, we had the chunky shoes mm-hmm. and the bootleg jeans and that wide whale corduroy. Oh, like, yes. Was that? Yes. You remember We've that? We've discussed on <laughs> like, this, I think maybe a million years ago, show. but I remember a specific 
discussion about the wide I, rail. I had a jacket. I had, I had a shirt with, um, I want to say it had leather patches on the elbows and it was like forest green. Oh yeah. And it looked like your boyfriend gave it to you. Yeah. I think everything was supposed to look like your boyfriend gave yep. it to you or something. Um, here's another funny thing. I was in Target a couple weeks ago and I saw the exact coats that Jenna and I bought our freshman year of college. Uh, we got them at Wilson's Leather and I remember we spent a lot of money on them. In fact, we put them on layaway nice. because we didn't have the money. But hers was a short, like dark brown suede coat with the toggle buttons. Yep. I totally remember the toggle buttons. And the Sherpa yep. interior. Yep. And mine was like basically the same, except it was long and camel colored. Okay. I saw those two coats, like identical. Somebody's to just going through the old like catalogs and stuff yes. and just recreating. I, I totally agree. So anyway, it, I love thinking about that because I feel like in those, I feel like a lot of I think it's an unusual young woman or teenager who really knows who she is fashion yeah. wise at that age. And we all play or we all dress one way, but wish we were dressed yeah. another way. Or like we think we're pulling it off, but then we look at pictures later. And we're yeah. like, Oh honey, yeah. <laughs> but we're all in it together. Like no one's really yeah. got it. And down. you're both influenced by what's around you. But also like you said, looking, looking outward at like, what's going to make me unique. Like what's my yes. style. Yeah. That's I also funny. remember my first I know that it was like the first month or two that I was at college because I remember like the weather, it was fall. I remember where I was on campus and I remember looking over and seeing this girl. She must've been an upperclassman. I don't know, but she had a perfectly buttoned pastel cardigan. And this was the time when like oh. people were wearing those tight cardigans over like, um, you'd wear them over like a collared yep. shirt. Yep. 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 I remember and they then, started um, sewing them together and just selling yes. them as one. Do you yes, that? I do. And like, because no one could get it right. Right. I still would can't always be pull askew. that off. Like button up shirt is too, there's too much. It's material. too much material and it's usually not fitted enough. And then the sweater was so fitted that it never looked right. And I, and I remember she would always have the, um, you would always have the bottom untucked and sticking out. Yep. Mm-hmm. But the, she only buttoned like, I want to say the third, fourth and fifth buttons. So she had the, the top of the cardigan was open and okay. the bottom of the cardigan was open. And yep. I tried to make that work and could not. Yeah. Like, like a lot. Like I fantasized about looking like that girl in a, <laughs> in a pink cardigan. Just couldn't do it. Just couldn't do it. Oh, I love it. <sighs> All right. We should move on to something else that will make us feel bad about ourselves. No, okay. this one will probably make us feel good. So Sarah describe your prom dress or dresses. Okay. I went to prom twice uh, with the same person. So it was his senior prom when I was a junior. And then he came to my prom when I was a senior. Um, I loved my first prom dress more in that moment than I loved my wedding dress at my wow. wedding. No, I didn't love the person more, obviously. Right. And I loved my wedding dress, but that is how much at the time I loved this dress. I got it in LA on third street promenade in Santa Monica, which by itself felt so grown up because we went down with my friend's older sister who went to UCLA and in a little boutique. And it was a dress off the rack that Elizabeth Shue had worn to the Oscars like a year or two, or maybe the Golden Globes or something like a year or two earlier. I put a picture in our show notes. I for see you, it. Megan. And I, I swear, I remember that dress. She was, it must've made a big splash. I think it did. And she, and this is again at the height of our like magazine reading days yes. where you could remember, I could probably tell you what other people wore to the Oscars those years. Like I just paid so much attention. Um, it's really simple. It actually looks like a wedding dress. It's still beautiful to me right now. I'll put a link in the show notes. You guys can see it. It almost looks like a simple sheath wedding dress. It's very dress. timeless, mm -hmm. but the way, but the, the wide straps. Yes. The, and they twist. Uh -huh. So they yeah. almost go into like a, a mini cap sleeve almost. Mm -hmm. Um, there's like some cleavage going on. It just felt like the most grown up dress ever. And Do you I have love a picture it. of yourself in it. Yeah. I will. I will dig up. I, I would have prom pictures and then I wore it again, like two years later to a winter formal in college. And you know, I'm not going to say I gained the freshman 15, but I was not the same size when I was a junior in high school that I was a freshman right. in college in the middle Most of winter, in the middle of winter in Chicago. Right. So it was very snug. And I just remember almost being disappointed. Like the experience of wearing it again, was not the same as wearing it the first time. Um, the next year for prom, I borrowed this short, simple red dress, almost like a 20s flapper dress without the fringe, but it kind of okay. hung straight like that. And I did the 1940s thing with oh, black fun. seamed stockings and these really fun shoes. And I remember thinking I was really clever because I borrowed the dress. And so then I spent any money that I had would have spent on a dress. I kind of went all out on the stockings and the shoes and the jewelry. And I had fun doing my hair. And it was, again, kind of that like dress up feel. Um, so it wasn't yeah. a spectacular dress, but I still had fun creating the outfit. How about you? 
Well, okay. So I went to prom twice in 1992. I went at the senior. I was a sophomore. I could not believe my dad let me go. And then, I know. I was like, I, I, yeah. I know, right? And then I didn't, I skipped my junior year and then I went my, my senior year. So 1992 and 1994, um, my sister came of age and was a teenager in the 80s. And uh-huh. so I looked to her and her friends as like the pinnacles of, of fashion. Right. And she had a beautiful prom dress. It was like this black um, big skirt, but it had this like white with black stripes, like the cuffs, like it almost had like a, not, not, it wasn't long sleeve. It's really hard to describe. I'll okay. see if I can dig up a picture. It was gorgeous. And I always thought like I would pour over magazines and look at those 80s style dresses with the big floofy skirts and yeah. everything and think that is what I want. And then I got to the 90s and I found 90s formal wear very disappointing. Yeah. It just was like, it was either like kind of that pageant style where it's like the top is super beaded and tight fitting. And then the skirt, I just wasn't into those. And then there was tons of sequins, really bright, weird colors. I mean, there was also bright, weird colors in the 80s, but I just, and like some of them were that, um, I guess, taffeta, Uh they're like kind of iridescent. And I didn't love that either. So I did end up with, oh, and the other thing is we lived in this small town. So everybody went to like one of three bridal shops to get their prom dresses. Unless right. you had tons of money in your parents. You weren't on Third you. Street Promenade in Santa Monica. No, I wasn't. No. <laughs> and like sometimes, you know, some parents would take their kids into like Chicago and shop. But that was like, that would have been considered kind of showy in our school. Yeah. Like, I don't think that would have flown really. Everybody kind of spent around the same sure. amount. It was just kind of that. That was the culture. So anyway, um, I went short because I wasn't a huge fan of the long styles then. So I had like, I really actually did like my dress a lot. My sophomore year, it was, um, it was blue. It was that iridescent, but it wasn't too over the, t- it wasn't like that crunchy fabric. Mm-hmm. It was I know exactly what you mean. feeling. And then it was, it had like this kind of fun sequin beaded top with like, what do they call it? The sweetheart neck, you know, like yep. where it goes down a little bit yep. um, on the bodice. And then I really liked that one and actually would have worn that again my senior year, but I didn't fit into it anymore. I had grown. Mm -hmm. Um, And then my senior year, I just, it was an emerald green short dress with a halter neck and it was all sequins. Like literally I looked looked like a disco ball. Um, I went today and like looked at like, you know, prom dress 1994 and found a bunch of pictures of like magazine ads and stuff. I remember them. Like I remember many of them because I spent so much time looking at, you know, 17 yeah. magazine yeah. and sassy and yeah. all those. Oh, I forgot about side. sassy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but anyway, this, the sequin dress really made me look like I had curves that I didn't actually have, which I really liked. So I, I liked the way I looked in that dress, but I just was disappointed in, in nineties formal wear. Yeah. <laughs> so. And I'm, as you're talking, I'm realizing that the, the slight age and schooling difference is big here yes. because I could tell you all about formal options from like 95 through 98 but I have a hard time even picture. I don't think I was even reading the magazines quite yet in yeah. 92. I was in sixth grade, 12, it you would, know, it so would it's have been just like, different. It would have been sort of like me looking to 1988 right. as a, as some kind of like right. way to, you know, pick out and the right. very, those things change fast. Yep. Especially yep. back then. I feel like that between the eighties and nineties, the style changed yep. like a crazy amount. So. Yep. All right. Well, so we're ta- now that we're talking about going back in time, um, Sarah, if you could go back to any period of time just for the clothes, what would it be? Well, let's have you answer this one first, just for okay. kicks, because I know yeah. we both have similar things to say, and I feel like yeah. I keep going first. So you go first. OK, yeah. I, well, in theory, like I love the look of the 50s and the 40s. I, like, I really think that the swing dresses and the wide skirts are so pretty and flattering. But like, I think that I would just be an epic failure on things like hats, hose, <laughs> gloves. Like I wouldn't ever want, I wouldn't know first of all the etiquette and like, I wouldn't want to follow it. Um, so I think I'd rather go to a time when women were being a little more daring on purpose. Yeah. I like like the twenties or the sixties. Um, and also, you know, we both just saw Mary Poppins returns, mm-hmm. which was set in the early thirties. And I would watch another movie just to see Jane's wardrobe, like just about her clothes. I mean, all of everything in that movie artistically, the ho- the houses, the clothes, like, yes. but yeah, her and her haircut and her clothing. <gasps> it was like all those was, wide-legged yes. pants mm-hmm. and like that kind of like um, men's business wear, but was. super feminine. Yeah. It was just adorable. Yes, it was I adorable. It. And I love like, that Every actress. time she came on the stage, I gasped. Like, yeah. oh. <gasps> I love that actress so much. It's <laughs> Emily too. Mortimer. If you guys haven't seen it, she's fantastic. I loved her in the newsroom. Okay. Um, so I have to answer this question now. I love like most vintage looks. So I had to think about like, what one would I really want to go back to? 
And I think back to my love of like post-war 40s, maybe into the early 50s, but before like the humongous skirts. Like when did that happen? Like early 50s? I guess I thought it was happening all along, but like people were dressing differently based on what they were. Because people, but, not everybody wore the big dresses in the 50s either. Right. That's true. So um, like some people wore the pencil skirts and like right. the, yeah. So, and I like that look a lot too. I do too. I do too. I don't know when it happened, but. Okay. Well, yeah. I'm going to go with mid forties through early fifties. Call the midwife, a league of their yeah. own, red lipstick, seamed stockings, like all of, all of the yeah. fussiness about the matching hats and handbags and pocketbooks. Like I, I would do it all. I mean, yeah. we're just fantasizing here. Um, That's true. I don't have to like, I'm not actually committing myself to wearing old school pantyhose. Right. But I also can really get drawn in by like early 70s, late 60s, mm. early 70s, like um, just long, long hair. I don't know. I can, I can kind of like get sucked into any of it. I love it all. I, I think that that last season of Mad Men, would that have been 69 or 70? When was that? Yeah. Something like that. Mm-hmm. I, I loved um, Peggy mm-hmm. and Joan, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. their wardrobe. Yeah. It's amazing. So, I mean, I guess if you have someone dressing you, any decade's going to look amazing, right? Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, I'm <laughs> thinking um, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which starts maybe mid 50s and right now or right around 1960. Does that sound right? I feel yeah, like that sounds right. Mid to yeah. late 50s. And like, obviously, when we're watching these shows, it, everything's been perfectly curated. Like, the actual right. cost to have those wardrobes. Have you are you right. are you caught up in Maisel? Like if you watch all not, of it, I'm okay. probably four episodes well, into this. This is season. not a spoiler, but I mean, you might have seen it. The scene where they're getting ready to go away for the summer and they have yes. all of their clothes yes. out. It's like yep. it's so satisfying because it's just I like know. everything matches. And her dad's I getting go back so and mad. Yes, we do. Like her dad's so mad that they have to bring all these clothes, and it's just it's so gross and extravagant. It would never like really happen anymore and even it only right. happened at the very elite at that time but there's something just like so excessive about like well we have to have this outfit and like you right, have to right. have this that matches this outfit like so of course we need an entire car for our clothes right exactly oh that's so funny loved it all right well last question we okay. we do go on but i love talking about all this stuff me too um now we're going back in time we're forced to go back into a period of time but it's one that you've already lived through okay what would it be? Do you want me to go first or do you want to go? No, first? I can go first. Is okay. this fashion related or just fashion? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Fashion related. Okay. Then you have to go first. Cause I think I okay. answered it wrong. Okay. That's not a problem. Well, for me, it would be the eighties because I was a kid. And so my mom dressed me Yeah. <laughs> in the eighties. It really wasn't until the very end of the eighties. Um, I would have turned 13. Well, no, I would have been 12 in 1989. So like I was starting to kind of be interested in clothes and, and starting to at least have an opinion about stuff. Right. But that was also the tail end of it. Right. So like, yeah. I would love to go back as like a young woman in like 84, 85, 86 mm-hmm. and figure out who I want to be. And I think I could dress a whole bunch of different ways. Like I could have seen myself with like the super short hair and that like punk, like yep. mm-hmm. punk look. I could have seen myself with the over the top, big crunchy hair. Like I didn't even learn by the time I learned how to do my hair, right. The eighties was over. Yeah, I would love to go back and be able to just bodaciously do all of it. Okay, this one's really hard because I feel like the last 20 years aren't cute enough yet. You know, like they just Mm -hmm. don't look. Everything else is so forgettable to me. I would want to do that again. My kids are watching a lot of movies right now that are like from the early to mid 90s. And like the moms, the way the moms dress in these like low budget movies about Uh, puppies or whatever. (laughs) so bad like I think like Home Alone era but like Home Alone was a really good movie with like a real budget so like all of the bad movies that came out around that time for some reason my kids are watching a lot of these they mostly involve animals like it's mostly like because there was a rash of them a rash yeah like Beethoven and even the first Beethoven's even good but it's all of the b-list ones that didn't make it to our memories and I always look at the moms in those and I'm like oh god well that was kind of like that was like the era that I was in in ending high school and going to college. And it was what I remember about that time is that it could go wrong very quickly. Like Mm -hmm. the mom jeans that now the girls are somehow pulling off and making them look cute Mm -hmm. did not look cute. No, they did not. When they actually were being worn. They did not. And they were always paired with like some kind of like puffy sweatshirt or something that was like super unflattering and regular hair was unflattered. Like everything just looked bleh. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. So I, I had an answer written down that was totally not about fashion. So, um, I'm kind of going off the cuff, but I'm going to go with 
early to mid 90s when I was like an awkward 12 year old looking at like the 25 year olds in the magazines mm. or like in movies. Um, like I'm thinking the Winona Ryder era. Yeah. Um, like a little bit of there was like a kind of an intellectual bookishness about some of those characters that I love short, like short, cute hair and glasses. Yep. Um, I don't know. I feel like that could be kind of fun. But I also feel like I'd have to think about that one more. Yeah. And I mean, technically, I also did live toward the end of, or through the end of the 70s. Uh, which I think could be fascinating to like some of the movies I've seen. But again, yeah. it's like when you watch a movie about an era, you're not really getting the, what the people true, really look correct. like. You're getting correct. the fashion. You're getting the stylist and the style, um, the styled version yes. of that. Well, that's so, why I like old family photos. We've talked about like how it's how fun it is to just look at the look at the everyday things of back to when we did our time capsule episode. Like yeah. every the everyday details of old family photos are so fascinating. I think you and I both love that because it isn't the styled version. It is the actual, it's the like actual the, thing, the books yeah. people actually had on their coffee table and the coffee mugs they were actually drinking out of. And yep. yeah. Ooh, that made me think of the Americans, which is another show that has great period dressing. Have you watched that show? I have not. So it takes place in the early eighties, like I think late seventies and early eighties, and then it moves forward into the eighties, but it's not the predictable. I think they do a really good job of purposely styling it as not what you stereotypically think. Mm -hmm. Um, and Carrie Russell just what well, doesn't look good on her, right? So, <laughs> oh. <laughs> all right. yeah, all right, guys. Well, this was fun, really fun. Um, we should mention that this is coming out on the Sunday in between a part one and a part two episode. The part yes. one is getting a lot, we're getting a lot of feedback about it. It's called Helping versus Helicoptering or Helicoptering versus Helping. I already forget. Um, just about helping our kids become more independent and kind of putting ourselves in check when it comes to being over involved, but also how that's harder than it sounds and maybe not right. as cut and dried as it sounds. So, um, if you are listening to this, when it comes out, I would really encourage you to listen to last Tuesday's show if you missed it. Um, and then look for that one on Tuesday. Cause I, I don't know. I feel pretty proud of it. I think it's an important Me too. conversation. It was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Everything we talked about, including possibly pictures of us at prom. I don't know. What else can we dig up? All of that is <laughs> always at the momhour.com. Just look for the show notes for this episode. All right. Talk to you soon, guys. Hi, friends. Megan here. I wanted to let you know about a new podcast I've just launched called The Teas Made. Think of it as a weekly cozy conversation with me over your favorite hot beverage on topics like wellness, creativity, family, hospitality, and more. Just look for The Teas Made with Megan Francis wherever you get your podcasts or head to theteasmade.com to find all those episodes. The Teas Made is your reminder to take a little break from the busyness of life. So come on in and get comfy. The Teas Made. The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like Chatbooks. Chatbooks makes it beyond easy to create beautiful photo books by importing your digital photos from anywhere. Instagram, Facebook, Google Photos, or directly from your phone. The books come in a variety of sizes with beautiful cover options and binding styles to choose from, and they start at just $15. Plus, we have a great deal just for our listeners. Use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20% off your purchase. Just download the Chatbooks app and use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20%.